later. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Loud Spot. I'm your host, Sebastian, right out of Oklahoma City. I got two co-hosts joining us today. We got Weird Wolf, Ava Gore. All the, are you even in Austin right now? Yes. Doing some modeling shoot or whatever it is that you're doing. Wearing her lingerie. Just I'm not wearing lingerie. And then we got Canada Rob joining us. Uh, I think for the first, third time actually on, on an actual podcast. And I'm excited to have Jeff Tui, who is my officially, my first official country artist, even though you're not only a country artist, you also do rock music and stuff like that. But for the sake of the show, I'm going to say you're popping my country, uh, country music, Cherry, is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a cherry, I'll give you a hot of your cherry, sure. <laughs> so, so, so you, so you, you know, I didn't realize um, that you are also into rock music and metal music, but play country music. So, how did you go from listening to like metal music and then kind of transitioning over to the country slash Americana, country rock? I guess you could say. Uh, I guess my, you know, my interest in different types of music has always kind of ranged. I think a big part of the metal phase was like early adolescence, you know, like anything that would really shock my parents if they found it in my closet. So Slayer, Sepultura, Cannibal Corpse, especially if they caught the covers of that. Uh, also went through a really big hip hop, gangster hip hop phase back then as well. Pretty much if it said parental advisory, I wanted to devour it. So, so that's kind of that's kind of where the metal started. And then, I mean, just so many of those guys have ridiculous voices. I'd say my favorite metal voice is probably Bruce Dickinson from Maiden. Uh, He's, he's badass and still sounds great. The last time I saw him live, it was unreal. Uh, so it started with that. And then high school, you know, a little more diversity, you know, some of the Dave Matthews started to sneak in. So now we're already starting to move more Americana, a little more acoustic. And then, uh, you know, around college, some more of the Ryan Adams stuff kind of popped in recently. Jason Isbell, the Sturgill Simpsons, uh, Chris Stapleton. So I kind of found a, you know, a combo. I'm a really big fan of the pedal steel. So some of my stuff might be considered more Americana, but as soon as you throw up something twangy in, like a pedal steel, or if a you know if a song's really feeling fiddle, then uh, then throw that in as well, and that automatically becomes associated with uh, with country. Um, and I you know I really started getting more into the country when I had visited San Antonio. I went down there during mm. Fiesta. I went out into Hill Country. I went to Green Hall. Um, went to JT Floors, and. Uh, you know, it was interesting. And then now a lot of the country that you see too, a lot of stuff I just mentioned, like Jason Isbell, Chris Stapleton, Sturgill. I mean, Sturgill put out, uh, oh man, I'm forgetting the name of it. It's something in the fury, but it was a hard rock mm. album that right after his Grammy award winning country one. And, and that was hard rock. So I think that a lot of the country stuff, it's just country fans are very open-minded. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be Florida Georgia line. It can be more of a hard rock, more of a Southern rock. And, you know, I, I grew up on a lot of that. A lot of classic rock melded too. I mean, classic rock could mean, you know, you're listening to some Dio or it could mean that you're listening to the Allman Brothers. So I guess I kind of have always lived within those worlds and uh, I have a background in theater and musical theater. Nice. So that there's always nice. genres happening and all that. So uh, yeah, this mo latest record, I've kind of been dancing between like a New orleans -y kind of Tom Waits kind of vibe and then more of the Americana singer songwriter. Dude, I love the fact, like, well, first I'm going to say this country and rock music, it's always kind of, they kind of go, they can go, depending on the style of rock and style of country, can go hand in hand. But I feel like more so recently and in, in the years that we live in we're today, I feel like there's a lot more people kind of combining the two. And sometimes with country artists, you can't even tell if they're a rock artist or a country artist. Based on how they look, go ahead, Ava. I know you got something to say I can tell. I would disagree. I would say that rock and country have always gone together, you know, from from the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Like, it's always gone together. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's no, like I'm that kidding. classic photo. Ash flipping the camera. <laughs> Very rock and roll, man, you know. So. And being from New York City... Uh, no, I know you're from all over kind of the East, the East coast area, but I would say, you know, New York is probably your home, like your home base, right? You don't really, mm -hmm. I don't, I wouldn't think you'd hear a lot of country music in, in New York. 
Like it's probably less like in Oklahoma and Texas and Canada. Rob over there in Canada, I'm, I, they, they probably got country music there too. But in New York, you don't really think you don't really think country music. Thinking of artists from New York. Yeah, that's why the record's called Hudson Delta. You know, because it's uh, I've heard it called a skyscraper Americana or you know skyscraper blues. So that's that's kind of the idea. Yeah, I, I don't really know how the combo happened. I guess you know I just like rock. I've always liked the sound. Uh, we did a lot of touring. Um, when I was out of college and I, I loved, you know, a lot of the different fans and roadhouses in the South. It was a lot of fun. So I guess I just internalized a lot of that, but you know, you'd be surprised with New York. I mean, the, the great thing about large cities like New York is you have people from all over. Mm-hmm. So they do, uh, I don't remember what's called. Like there's this inaugural text, uh, this annual, sorry, uh, Texas concert that comes through. And a lot of times it'll be like Randy Rogers band or Pat Green, a lot of those bands uh, will come through and there's still very big crowds for them, you know? So I think like you were saying, a lot of the melding of the rock in the country. And I don't know, sometimes I wonder like if that's, uh, I, I do agree that they've always been together, but it does seem like it's almost a divide in some ways. It's like, you either like the music with the guitars or you like the music with the computers. Which one are you picking, you know? <laughs> right, and, right. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Rob. When I hear New York, I think of Biggie and you said hip hop earlier. So like, what's your biggest hip hop influence? So I actually have a band called Concrete Jungle that uh, is playing this Friday, actually, locally, and it's all live, old-school hip-hop. So we have a percussionist, uh, my pal Damon Grant, who plays, uh, who was on tour recently with uh, Charlie Hunter. He plays that. So it's all a bunch of musicians who typically dabble more on the rock and jazz, but uh, we play a lot of hip-hop live. So I love Tribe Called Quest. Uh, uh, Chronic Dr. Dre was a big one uh, for my age group. I was in about sixth grade, I think, when that came out. Uh, love that. Biggie's probably my favorite lyricist. Um, as well. Uh, Fuji's liked a lot of their work. So a lot of that stuff that's concerning mean, old school always changes depending on what, what group that you're in, you know, what, what age group you're in. So that's one of the things that band has done is we can't just play the old school that was to my age group because old school to a lot of people who are in our audience now is low by flow rider, which, you know, like, <laughs> with, 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 so true. So true. Like, yeah, like, Flam was my, uh, was mine. So, yeah, I mean, I, a lot of the stuff that I like is a lot of those old samples with those old jazz records and stuff like that. That's kind of, that was my initial interest in hip hop. Pretty much anything that fell between 1992 and 96 and then throughout high school after that, you know, which was more of the Biggie and the Tupac and all that. I want to talk about 2009. So it was on your website, on your bio, you talked about how, you know, were, were, you, were you getting signed in 2009 and then something something just kind of didn't work out what what's that whole story what's what's that all about yeah so i was signed to an independent deal with an independent label in uh 2006 okay. right out of college and uh which is pretty surreal because you're like oh yeah hell yeah i got a record deal out of college on the shit you know but like, i was also in the back of my head like this is not normal and you should be really psyched about getting this like right out right out so but you know it was interesting because it was right out of college they're so like yeah everything's going the way that it's supposed to and I think life gave me a much needed kick in the ass around 2008. So we had, we had done some touring on that and we created a new album while we were with that label. And then right before the album was about to drop, uh, the funding dropped out because of 2008. So the primary stockholders or shareholders in the company mm-hmm. had to move their funds elsewhere, you know, to something that was a little more stable, so to speak. Actually, I don't need to put the quotes in there. Music. <laughs> 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 unstable so <laughs> were you, were your, were your, was your music played on some like top 100 radio stations or you, you charted you charted back then yeah a lot of a lot of uh triple a stations i'm not exactly sure what the what the charting was but a lot mm-hmm. of triple a stations song knock on wood which now could actually probably get a country revamp now that i think about it but it was more like singer songwriter and then the, the album after that was a little bit more starting to explore the more neuronsy like classic rock uh, kind of vibe, which now the new record has about half the New Orleans vibe. So, yeah, uh, it was the first one had Knock on Wood. And then, yeah, the deal dropped right before we dropped my album Cocoon, which had my song Bourbon Street on it, which was uh, probably my most popular song at the moment. You know, it makes sense that you that, that you agreed to come on the show, because every time I try to get a country artist on, they're like, they hear the intro. They're like, nope, fuck this. <laughs> Never mind. I don't want to do that show anymore. Oh, no. I was, I was listening through a bunch today to just get myself prepared, and I was like, "Fuck yeah, let's go!" That's what I'm yeah. saying, dude. I love, I, 
I no. love I love the Louisiana like that that swamp. Did you any of that like swampy um, kind of country? Because you have a song. What what's that song called? With like it's like an animated music video with like skeletons in it. Yeah, the devil's, the devil's, in, devil's New in New Orleans. Yes. Did you notice from Canada the way he said New Orleans? New Orleans. He's all the booted. You know, <laughs> he's all uh, well, it was uh, tra tragically hip though. Didn't they have New Orleans is drowning or something like that? So tragically hip, man. Canadian. They're no. I think that was their most popular song was about New Orleans. So New Orleans is sinking, and I don't want to swim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, get the I, I, just, I just fake laugh for no reason. Right there. Right there. I just gotta make that laugh. What does that even mean? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. So okay. Jeff, did you do, um, do you also write songs for other people or is that, is just for your, just for yourself? I'm, I'm open to it, but it's most, mostly been for myself and I usually write by myself. I think I have, you know, one or two, uh, what, one or two co-writes maybe. I think I had a lyrical co-write and, uh, and a couple others, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's mostly all for myself or whatever. And then, you know, to finish answering your question about Devils in New Orleans or the song Bourbon Street that I had, like. I think a lot of that was that music theater background as well, because uh, I mean, a, a lot of the American music tradition, a lot of that comes from the South, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Chuck Berry, probably the father of rock and roll. You know, a lot of people always assume it's Elvis, but it's, you know, it's Chuck Berry, mm -hmm. uh, blues, a lot of the, you know, Robert Johnson. Uh, so I think it's only natural to explore some of that. And I, I really took to the New Orleans -y kind of stuff. And then I think the three theatrics, I had never even heard of Tom Waits, to be honest, or I had heard of him, but I had never listened to Tom Waits before I wrote that song, Bourbon Street. And then a lot of people were like, you got to check this guy, Tom Waits out. And it you know blew my fucking mind. Uh, so I, yeah, I think it's only natural to explore that as an American songwriter, because that's where a lot of our musical traditions come from. Go ahead, Amy. Right. Um, what is the hardest part about writing for you? Um, perfectionism. Nah. Uh, you know, just, just, uh, you want everything. Yeah. I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, but you know, you keep, sometimes you just got to put things out there. So there's, you're always finding that fine line between wanting to be prolific and wanting to be precise. So it's, I'd say that that's, that's probably it is perfectionism. That's my problem is like, I, I'm anti-perfectionism. Like, I'm like, put that shit out there. Let's go. It sounds good. Just go, 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 go. Can you tell he doesn't have a filter? <laughs> Looks like I might be a big <laughs> Yeah, so I'd say the most difficult part of that. But, you know, some songs come like that. Uh, Bourbon Street came like that. The Devils in New Orleans, the lyrics to that came very easy. It was very playful. But then a song like Old Roads, I took a lot of time on those lyrics to try to make them, you know, I think Tom Petty is one of my favorite artists as well. And uh, he had a great way of saying really deep shit very simply so that everyone could get it you know and i think that that's sometimes the key is that you want to be careful not to be uh to you know rebel in your artistry too much and really think about you know okay who do i want to listen to it you know i think one of the most important things about being an artist is relating to other people so it's trying to figure out okay how do i how do i say this you know so that people feel something you know, while also being true to your vision itself and what you're trying to say. So, yeah. and that's again, perfectionism. How do you find the balance between those two? You know, I think it's really cool. Rob, I'll let you say something, but I, what I think is really cool is a lot of musicians get stuck on their one track style of music. I think it's really neat that you have influences in lots of different genres, lots of different artists. That makes you very unique um, with your songwriting because you're going to pull from different things of how you grew up and, and different artists that you've listened to that have inspired you. And I think as, as musicians, as we get older, you know, when we're young, you're like, you're a rocker or you're a rapper or you do country or this, but nowadays it's really more of a melting pot, but the older you get in my age group anyways, the more I appreciate all kinds of different music. And, and I think that's really neat that you're able to talk about that. Um, and, and pull those things in. Go ahead, Rob, and then I want to talk about Old Roads after your question, after he answers it, and play the music video. So go ahead and shoot. Absolutely. So you have Old Roads, and then you went, uh, you have Old Roads, and then there's Bourbon Street, and then 44. I, I listened to all these songs today, and they're amazing. Thank Absolutely you. Absolutely stunning. And then, like, Real Love? What inspired that? Like, Real Love and Monogamy? The beats of those are just it's totally different from from old roads it's 
unique. Thanks. Yeah, uh, really unique sound. Yeah, jo- uh, that the uh, so all the drums on Cocoon are Josh Dion, uh, who's one of the best drummers out there. Um, he has a great group right now called Paris Monster, where he's pretty much playing the drums with one hand and uh, playing like synth with another hand, and he has a bass player in the band as well. So, a lot of those grooves and stuff are you know, as an artist, you can explain to the other players what you're looking to do, but then you also you try to hire or you try to bring in and collaborate with the right people so that you give them you're like okay here's here's the playpen that we're playing in Mm. go nuts you can even climb to the edge of the fence if you want just try to stay in here you know but so yeah a lot of that is to the credit of josh dion as far as the the beats and the grooves on cocoon and again Mm. there's a lot of that you know well i kind of wanted to have a an americana vibe but you know (laughs) <laughs> I really like, uh, I think monogamy, a lot of the beats or one of the beats in the breakdown is inspired by uh, the breakdown in the middle of Great Day in the Morning on the D'Angelo album Voodoo. And the drummer on that was uh, Questlove. And so you I know, said in the middle like of that. All this knowledge, man, that's so cool. You know, like all this knowledge of, of like just different artists. It's like, I know none of this stuff. It's like, it's like I'm getting a, a lesson here. Like you should be a teacher, like a music teacher. Hey, I, I do want to ask you. We only have a like not a whole whole lot of time. Uh, my wife is watching, and she wants to know: Does he love Otis Redding? He's an amazing artist. That's bluesy and folk. Yeah, I I, I love Otis Redding. Uh, similarly, I love Bill Withers. Uh, Bill Withers uh, live at Carnegie Hall is probably my favorite live album. But yeah, I love Otis. He was uh, you know, he was he was gone before his time, and he was ahead of his time with his music. He was uh. He was unreal. Uh, show a little tenderness is unreal. Uh, unreal vocal. I hope I that, that is the name of the song. Just where he has. That. <laughs> <laughs> knock on wood. Knock on wood. Don't worry. I fuck up all the time when I'm on here. Don't worry. Don't even worry about it. Even... And yeah, I mean, handle and all that stuff. I mean, you know, sitting on the dock of the bay. I've, I've played that many times for people around a campfire. So yeah, I, I love Otis. Okay, now let's go to Old Roads. I want to know before I play the song, what does this song mean to you specifically? It's a- song about home and hopefully everybody can relate to it well there you go all right short sweet and to the point all right here we go with old roads by jeff tui here we go Johnny has a crack in the silver can. He said it looks like El Dorado. It's back where it began. Cause we travel around this country, turning metal into gold. But when we needed inspiration, down these dusty streets we rolled. Now we know. I have swam There's a little town to come from It's part of who I am Through every passing season After every setting sun There's a home that I come back to After living on the run There's only one
dude, that song can relate to so, so many different people. I mean, it, my wife said, mentioned Oklahoma, uh, you know, it, really, no matter where you're from, those bring back memories, I think, to almost anyone's childhood. And great, you have great voice too, man. Great voice, great song, great video, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, that was actually, uh, that was co-directed uh, and co-produced by my friend Liron Kahanov, uh, who worked on Madam Secretary. He just finished working on Clerks 3. Uh, and oh, so that, that was filmed in the, oh. middle, uh, in the middle of COVID. That was October 2020. And so, uh, you know, it was, that was the interesting thing about t going through 2020 was just in some ways it was earth shattering because you couldn't go out and do what you wanted to do. You couldn't go out and play shows and, and do what, you know, I feel I was born to do. But it was really a great opportunity to get out of the grind of being a professional musician and focus on the art of it. So we had him come up with a bunch of great uh, other New York tech people, you know, other camera people, other lighting people. And a lot of people hadn't been working, so everyone was stoked and it was all filmed outside. So everyone felt safe. And uh, yeah, so it was one of those things where necessity breeded productivity. I got a very important question I think everyone's going to want to know the answer to. So bra brace yourself for this, okay? All you right. Ready? All right. I think so. How did you get your band name? <laughs> <laughs> Honest, honestly, I had I had several bands uh, in high school and in college, and it just got to a point where you know some people just wanted to do it as a hobby, and I wanted to do it uh, professionally, mm -hmm. and I was making, and I didn't have a band at the time, and I said, well, you know, fuck it, I'm just going to go out and do it myself. So what you know. It wasn't a total ego trip, ego trip as much as it was just I didn't have a band. You know, I, I hired some really great professional musicians to do my first record. And it was just more, I didn't want to wait on anybody else. I knew what I wanted to do. And so if I call it Jeff Tui, you know, unless I quit, the band name can stay. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask if you ever experience like writer's block, if there's something in particular that helps you get out of that. Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, writer's block, and then you know, again, coupled with the the perfectionism, I have a lot of songs that I'm like, ah, that sounds like this song, or it's not, it's it's hard to not be uh to be influenced. So, yeah, I think that right now, I mean, I, I just put out uh, Hudson Delta, and I have a song a song coming out called Santa's Bringing Coal with a classic animation, kind of like in the style of Frosty and Schoolhouse Rock and and Peanuts, and then after that. You know, I, I have a couple songs, but I have a lot of song ideas lyrically, but not a whole lot of melodies floating around right now. And so I'm a little nervous, you know, but it, it's going to be interesting because I have a lot of lyrical ideas. So usually, usually the music comes first for me with a lyrical idea. But right now I have a lot of lyrical ideas and no music. So it's kind of like I've I've Bernie Toppin and now I need to Elton John. So <laughs> I'm a little nervous, you know, because, again, with writer's block, I'm not somebody who rushed. This was... Hudson Delta came out, what, this is 2021? My last record came out 2009. So I'm definitely not somebody who rushes to get things out. And that's mm. that's difficult in this environment right now because, you know, avenues like Spotify and whatnot, they reward you algorithmically for releasing consistently. Mm. But I don't want to rush things out just so I, I hit a playlist. I want to make sure it's the right stuff. Otherwise, if, if it's not something that you're proud of, then what's the, you know, what's the point of having you know, millions of people hear it. So it's a yes. Good, it's it's a good thing I'm not in your band. Because if I was in your band, like every song, fucking hit, put it out there. Put it out there. Let's go. Let's go right now. Reminds me of eating at McDonald's. Good. Oh, reminds me of uh reminds me of going there. Awesome. Great. Print it. Are you currently are you currently signed um to a record label or do you have a management team or booking agent uh helping you get your stuff out there and uh, not a, no, it's, uh, it's all kind of self-run. Um, I'm working with a company called shark attack right now. They handle all of my digital marketing. Uh, my publicist's name is, uh, Jason Duarte and he, uh, he runs a company called Scorpion LTD. So it's, uh, it's an independent operation with, uh, with subcontractors and I'm distributed through, uh, Vidia and, uh, via, um, the, the distribution company is called Vidia, but, uh, the company that handles it for me is called head bitch music. Cool. And, uh, so yes, but <laughs> very, it's very, operation uh, definitely open to finding a deal as long as it's the right deal um, mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily looking for accolades I don't need to be selling out stadiums you know I, I just want to consistently release great music you know like so 
ultimately it would be nice to have somebody who can kind of help pump it more because the more, you know, the more somebody else handles that, the more you can focus on your artistry and on your performance, but you want to make sure it's the right deal too. Otherwise you're just across the barrel. Uh, here's a question. Who does he run the lines through when he's writing his wife? Oh, like me. <laughs> I always have her help me out <laughs> if I'm writing some, do you have anybody that, that helps you when you're writing music to listen to it or give creative input at all? Uh, uh, the band, you know, when I, when I bring, when I bring the song to my, to my band, they'll, uh, they'll check it out, you know, but it, it, there'll be like slight suggestions more like, well, how about this groove instead of this groove, you know? And again, I like to be open to that. Uh, this last, this last time out, I remember my keyboard player, Dave Archer, uh, who plays with this band Uni as well. He's, he's kind of very into metal as well and very into prog rock and all yeah. that rush Canada. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> He actually Shout out to Canada. <laughs> yeah. he, uh, you know, Dave had nice compliment to me in the studio. Uh, Brian Forbes was the co-producer of this record, and Brian had a lot of ideas. He's like, just try this with the song instead. And I was like, okay, cool. And Dave's like, that's interesting. A lot of artists won't fuck with that. They have the idea, and that's that. I'm like, well, worst thing that happens is we try it, and if it doesn't sound good, then we go back to what I said. So, you know, I'm always open to trying new things. Uh, as far as my wife, not my wife. And she, she's like, that's great, honey. And I'm like, no, it's fucking not, not great. <laughs> <laughs> it sucks. It sucks. And then we record. I'm like, oh, great. Yeah. It's, well, that's, oh, that's like, I froze. <laughs> I froze. I froze. That's okay. I can keep, uh, I can keep yapping while you're free. Okay, I can handle your aggression. <laughs> well, I'll just, let's see, I froose. I fro Hold on a second here. Let me see that's if I can do something here. Oh. oh. Am I back? Oh. Am I back? What are we doing about you, Sebastian? No, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't Okay, see well, that's all right. Well, then you don't need to see me anyways. We're about to end this show right now. Real quick, because uh, I don't have time to fuck with my camera right now. You got any tours coming up? Uh, not yet. We're going to be planning something probably in, uh, you know, sometime between March and June. We're going to be planning on some tours again coming up. So that's uh, that's the next thing. We want to make sure we do it right and do the production right. So we do, we're doing a lot of private work right now around here and just getting ready to get this uh, Santa's bringing coal out. And then, yeah, I'd say probably... About March or so, you'll see us crank it on the road probably through the summer. Awesome. I have no idea what happened to my camera. Hold on. Hold on. Well, we're going we're to end the show because I can't find myself. We're at 30 well, minutes already. Go ahead, Do you have a website, social media, merch? There you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, the website is Jeff, jeff 2 dot com, And then uh, I'm mostly active on Instagram and Facebook, and that's uh, – V T H E Jeff two E J E F F T U O H Y. So yeah, I hope you'll hit me up and uh, I'm really good at responding and I love talking music with people. So definitely hit me up there. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm sorry. My camera messed up. At least it was at the end of the show. It was at the end of the show. What you want something else, Ava? He's out. Oh, I'm not done. I'm not done. I gotta say, I gotta say, even though no one can see me, they can still hear me. Please go check out our, our YouTube uh, channel just the loud spot go to www.theloudspot.net and our patreon page for three dollars a month you can help support us jeff you've been such a great absolutely fantastic uh guest tonight thank you so much for sharing your experience with us absolutely loved it that's all we got peace out rock on much Thanks, love hey, hey jeff don't go anywhere stay right there just for one second all i'm right, right here we go this is the loud spot outro by nothing short of tragic is this all talk with no action? No. Is this my thoughts with distraction? No. Is this what I bought that's in fashion? Or is this the loud spot with Sebastian? Yes. Does nothing short of tragic have his back again? Yes. Does everything that's good really have to end? Yes. A pin post has a pin show, so to get more episodes, make an order, this is over. Thanks for watching our video. Don't forget to click the like and share button. Don't forget to go to our YouTube and subscribe. If you want to listen to our audio and pick up some cool merch, go to www.theloudspot.net. Peace out. Rock on. Much love.